and keep that light on their life. Moses didn't go wrong because he esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasure of Egypt. Now, again, I don't think we can really, most of us appreciate what kind of wealth we're talking about there. The superpower of the world, Egypt, had a lot of gold, had a lot of wealth. But the reproach, even the reproach of Christ following Jehovah God is far greater riches than anything this world has to offer. Like we were talking about earlier, Jesus said, what shall I get in exchange for his soul? Right? You can gain the whole world and lose your own soul. There's no, it, it's not a balancing act there. There's no balance to it. So he says in the book, one night I thought him foolish when he made such a decision in Egypt. Somebody made it that's a lot of skin, right? Even the children of Israel, when he slew that Egyptian, remember, even the children of Israel said, you're going to tell us that he did that. They didn't even get it, did they? They didn't grasp this. For him to sound to reject all of this wealth and prestige and power and just suffer. To be a wanderer in the wilderness didn't make sense to them. But then he goes on to give an example of Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. And that's what we call the scene of the transfiguration when Jesus, Peter, James, and John go up on the mountain and he speaks with Moses and Elijah. And what does Moses and Elijah have to talk to Jesus about? Anybody remember? His death. How Jesus was going to die. Him. These are Moses and Elijah, these great, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, and these great faithful men who went to their reward in paradise were still in need of that sacrifice of Jesus. That's how powerful that is. But nevertheless, when you look at the fact that Moses is allowed to be there on that scene and talk to Jesus, did he choose well? Of course he did. The world said, oh, that's foolish. You're going to give up all these riches and power and prestige to... Well, where's Moses now? Where are those people? Right? So yes, he chose well. He says, indeed, you know, we must cease... Now, this, I'm reading this because and I have Mark Mayden has a big circle on this page in my book. We must cease making decisions on the basis of the moment. Rather, this whole picture, including eternity, must be considered. Have you ever given in to the pressures of the moment that leads to regret? Maybe, maybe it's even purchasing something. Oh, Gotta have that, gotta have it, you buy it, you get home, have it. What's it called? Buyers or remorse. Can you have that spiritually speaking? Yes. Yes. We need to challenge ourselves and do as he says here and cease making those decisions based on the moment. Go sleep on it, right? Take some time to, is this really what I need to do? Is this really the best course of action rather than looking at the big picture, seeing the big picture? Eternity is in. Balance, I must consider that. So he goes on and uses some illustrations. The original ruler did not have a proper sense of values. I want to tell you something. The rich young ruler that we talked about in Matthew 19, he had a sense of value, didn't he? He had a sense of value. Clearly, we all have a sense of value. But no Brother Winker says in the book, he didn't have a proper sense of value. Proper sense. Well, what was that scene about? Verses 16 through 22. He comes to Jesus. He wants to know what he needs to do to hear eternal life. He said, mentioned the Old Testament, mentioned the law of Moses. He said, I love that. These things are you. So when you look at the scene, he comes to the right source. He asks the right question. He gets the right answer. But he has the wrong attitude. Right? Yeah. He didn't have a proper sense of value. Where was his value? Jesus tells him, go and sell all that you have, give it, we'll come and follow me in my treasure. What did he say? What did Jesus say? He went away sorrowful because he had great riches. He went away sorrowful because he had great riches. Which many times I've heard preachers say, and I've said to myself, the riches had him. That was more of the same. We don't read anywhere where Jesus revisits that scene, do we? We don't have any. Anything to indicate that, that he ever crossed paths with that young man again. If that's the case, what are we led to believe? He perished. 
He perished with his riches. He went away lost, didn't he? Because in his mind, the wealth that he had given, now, now think about it, step back from it, and, and go back to it again. He comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And he says, what? Why was he doing that? Do you ever stop and say, why was he keeping the commandments? Are you ready for it? I got to ask you for it. He wanted eternal life. But when he had to balance the value of eternal life and holiness and being with God and his riches, what went? What wins? The majority of the time with mankind. The cares of this world. Even in the church. Even among us. We, we go to services with everyone who works from them. We do our best. We read our Bibles. We pray. We give our money. We take the Lord's Supper. We bow our heads and we focus and we pray and take the Lord's Supper. Sometimes I like people say we go through emotions, but a lot of times we're focusing on what Jesus did for us. But, but you get you get us to where we have to really do the balancing act and determine, am I going to choose my worldliness or am I going to choose righteousness? Where do we go most of the time? It goes back to that old saying that more cake than he did too. You had to mention cake, you remember. Now I'm going to be thinking about cake. Anyway, uh, yes, we want our cake and we want to eat it too. Exactly. We want heaven. We want eternal life. Which really, if we're honest, when we say the word "faith," and we're looking at this context, we really is more so just don't want to go Right? That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We will go wrong because we don't have a proper sense of values. He exchanges. He says in the book, he exchanges treasure in heaven for earthly wealth, or what regrets he now, or what regrets he now has. We can't even battle that. The regrets that he now has. Now he gives another example, and, and this helps us to see a little bit in number two. He says the rich man, the account of the rich man and Lazarus, did not have a proper sense of values when he was here on this earth. But you know what happened on the other side. We're given about that. God, as the Lord Jesus says, Lord opens up the panoramic picture for us to see on the other side of what it looked like for this person. We didn't get that from the rich young ruler, but he gives us this with the rich man and Lazarus. Now on the other side, you had Lazarus who was tormented in this life with hardships and difficulties and poor and sores and he just looked for crumbs to fall from the rich man's table and going to give him dogs come and leave his wounds. The rich man fared sumptuously in this life. He would wear straw, herbal, clothing, he would be everything that he wanted, he had. But they both died. They both died and they have Lazarus and those of Abraham and the text says comfort. But then you have the rich man in torment. Now, while the rich man lived in this life, he had a he, had, he didn't have a proper proper sense of value. But he immediately changed, didn't he? The rich man now has a proper sense of value, but it doesn't do him any good, does it? It doesn't help him now. It's too late. There's a great gulf fixed. Abraham would say to him. You can't even send Lazarus back to talk to your brothers and tell them not to come to this place. But listen to what he said. You send them back, is it all? So what do we learn from that illustration? Keep your back. No, not that illustration. <laughs> what do we learn from that rich man's situation? There's a lot of things to learn. First one that comes to my mind is that uh, the decisions we make in this life, you know, determine our eternity. And once we cross the threshold of death, there's, that's it. it is, you said the decisions we make in this life affect our eternity. And once we cross that threshold, it's too late. That's exactly right. Get it right now. Learn what matters most. Now, this is an adult pastor for the most part. Uh, pretty much everybody here, parents or grandparents. This is, this is why God set up the family first. Because the sense of values that our children have start where? With what they see in us. 
what they see in us, how they see this matters to me, this is a, lots of us don't matter to them. If, if the church stuff is just a good thing to do, that's all we'll ever be. But if it is your life, they'll see that too. And it's important for us to get that right. That we're, we're not, we are not physical beings with a spiritual side. You understand that? We are spiritual beings with a physical body. Now, is that just semantics? No, it's a mindset, number one. Reminds us of what really matters. Having a proper sense of values. He says he chose to have his good things. And he, you know, he chose to have his good things on time side. Our Bible Lazarus chose to have his on the other side. See, Lazarus couldn't really change his physical circumstance. It, it, he was in a bad situation. But he didn't live for his physical, but he lived on the other side. The proof is in the pudding, as the old saying goes. He received it on the other side. Their choice determined their inescapable destiny, which is exactly what the way was talking about. Their choice determined their, but note again how Brother Winker phrased that, inescapable destiny. It's not set now what your destiny will be. It's set when? When you die, think back to Hebrews 9.27 that we mentioned briefly in the sermon a while ago and heard it many times, especially at funerals. It is appointed, for it is appointed, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, what? Judge. See, it's when the judge says guilty or innocent. That's when the sentence is handed down, so forth. So making these decisions now is so important for us. Number three, he says an illustration that will help us. I'm going to read this whole paragraph to you. I'm hoping to trust you probably read it. But it, it, it said, King fell in love with the present girl, desiring him to show his affection. He brought her, a, or brought her an expensive ruby ring and had it beautifully wrapped. When she received it, she discarded the ring and wore the box. And some people today, he says, pay her the compliment of a close imitation. We discard life's true treasures or true values and go about wearing boxes. <laughs> I get that. You know where my mind is? I think we're my mind is. We get close to this season. Dear, when your children were little, you thought, you get this really nice toy for them and they said, I play a box. Like, don't you get it? This is what I want. This is what I want. And, and why we, we laugh at that because they're children and they're, that's, you know, that's understandable that they don't understand the value of things this nature is what they're doing. But this is not also be just we don't understand that. Because we saw that commercial over and over again when they were watching their cartoons and this is the one they got to have. And you could have just given them a box. How do we, how, how do we value things? What's the number one thing that we use to help us to determine the value of things? How important it is to us. How important it is to us. You, you, you take some children into the store and you say, okay, you need a new pair of shoes. We'll get you this new pair of shoes. And you pull out here, here are a pair of shoes. And say, uh, they don't have the right thing on. I, I, I wouldn't be called dead in those. You've never been called dead. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. Do you really need shoes or not? You see what we're doing with that? We're, we're letting the world get to what is. That's why it's a challenge to evangelize, is because we have difficulty helping others to see the value of their soul's salvation. If you could hear what you said, that's why I'm trying to evangelize. Let's say we Americans. Okay? And I think you understand what I mean by that. We have a hard time evangelizing because we have to help people see their needs. We see it sometimes even in America. You go to some of the poor neighborhoods and not poorest and things of that nature, talk to people and they'll say, you're going to have a little bit different response than you are in some of the more affluent neighborhoods. You may be more afraid to go into that poor neighborhood, but you're going to have more reception there. 
doing to keep the balance. That's the idea. Moses never lost sight of his reward. He saw the value. He didn't understand that Jesus understands. God understands that I'm giving this much in this relationship. How much did he give? We talked about that earlier too, didn't we? God so loved Jesus said it's finished, the Holy Spirit revealed they've done their part for us. What we do? And this old pop song that used to be out on the radio, what have you done for me like this? Imagine God asking us that question. We sing it sometimes in the song, I gave my life for thee, but hast thou given for me? It's a powerful sentiment. You look at what he did for us. He kept his eyes focused on heaven. He kept his eyes focused on diligently seeking that reward that God has to offer. Being with God, he uses Abraham next as an example at the bottom of page 10. Abraham never lost sight of the reward either. He waited, this is back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. He waited for a city whose foundation and builder is God, not man. Abraham's another great example in this. Abraham left a very wealthy city. He was a wealthy man himself. Early colonies was cutting edge in that day and age. And he left it behind to wander in well and tents. But he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. He looked for some sure foundations. The things we know about early colonies is through archaeological digs. It's not a thriving city anymore. You ever thought that one day New York City may not be what it is today? That it may come to naught. Say, oh, New York can do that. Detroit's kind of showing us a good example of it, isn't it? It was once a lot different than it is today. These are not foundations on which we can build. The Republican Party, the Democratic Party, these are not things, this is not what our sure foundation is. Our citizenship is where? See, he goes on and says, Paul never lost sight of his reward either. And he uses 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes, key things you may want to consider as you read this, Mark, even. For we, that third verse of the Lord, for we know. Not we assume we hope we wish. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this kind of night were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly. What does that mean? That spiritual house, this tabernacle, we use the word tabernacle, but often use the word tabernacle, 
which we may have a different translation. We may say a tent, right? When you think of a tent, what do you think of? Temporary. Temporary, exactly. Temporary. You, most people don't live in a tent. They go camp in a tent for a temporary getting away in the rough right? To go back to their permanent dwelling, their home. That's how we view it even physically speaking, but that's even a temporal thing, isn't it? This temporal life, this temporal body that we have, that we have to put all that imperfection, that immortal body. We earnestly, he goes on and says in the book that his translation said, where this we grown earnestly desire to be both on with our habitation, our dwelling place, not a tent anymore, but our dwelling place, which is from heaven. He said, he also says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Paul would say that right in the tent. We finally, at the end of all of this, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day, but not to me only. But what? What does that loving is appearing have to do with? It's the realization of our faith and our hope. The real, good, good answer there. The realization of our faith. Our hope. But that loving is appearing is that it's a desire. I long for that. I long to see it. I want you, I want you to be, don't, don't make any facial comment. I'm going to be able to turn so I don't see If Jesus was going to come back, man, would you be happy about that? Think about it. Just think about it. Are you desirous that he comes back right now? Or are you doing some things that maybe you shouldn't have been doing? Maybe you're, you're not, you haven't been serious about worshiping him today. You've just been going through motions as him was talking about. This is, it's, it's, it's not real to you. Until he splits the skies and he gets. He's going to give a crown of eternal life to those who love his appearing. Now is the day to do that. Finally, he says, we too are encouraged to do likewise. And he uses Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Know that effort. Seek, look for those things which are above. Set your affection on things above, not on things this earth. Set those affections. Make them firm and fixed. Set your mind even on things above, on things of the earth. He talked about a boy, he said it was about the glory. He put a V over his own glory. Every day he'd go out, he'd see that V. That was his goal. I'm going to be about the glory. Guess what? He became about the glory. He says, we need to put an age over our door. That every time we walk out the door, we're focused on heaven's going to be my home. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven, and you're not going to stop me. Who's the first person we need to tell? I'm going to heaven, and you're not going to stop me. Self. Who's the second? <laughs> you get the idea. It starts with me. Having that goal focused oriented mindset. Philippians 3 14, he goes and says, Let us never take our eyes off of that same prize of heaven being our eternal home. Conclusion, he says, We can be blameless, harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we can shine as lights in the world. This book is a great verse. Great verse, because it tells someone we can do this. We can be blameless? Yes. What does that mean? Does that mean someone's perfect? No. It just means above reproach. But the blame will stick. The blame doesn't stick. You're living above that. You're living above that. Harmless. Children of God. Without fault in God's eyes, He's pardoned us. And doing it in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Acts 2 verse 4. With many other words that He exhort and say, Save yourselves from this untoward, which is the world. Again, crooked generation. You know what literally that means? We can swim on the stream. Christians can swim upstream because we have a life preserver, which is Jesus. And so, Lord willing, we'll pick back up next Sunday with chapter 2, talking about how we'll drive the world so long. He shows us how it can be done. We'll, we may deal with a couple of these questions as a review before we go into this. If you want to be looking at those uh, first section, first three questions there.
under the exercise that you want to do. I hope you take one of the books and be working on those or try to those ones as well. That's all the time we have. Unless you have any comments or questions. Uh, you are just